Well, we have had a great discussion today, and we uh, want to end this on a positive note. We talk about solutions, talk about fixing this problem. And I have just the people here to, to tell me, to tell us how to do that. Um, it's very important that this not just be a conversation that we have and then we go back to back home and, and forget. Um, there are concrete solutions that have already been suggested by a task force that studied this by these people that were here today. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, Mimi, uh, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, there is a, there's a successful program in Tulsa. There's a, a program in Oklahoma City called Remerge. Um, we have some exciting things, and I want to get more about that. Uh, we have some exciting things going on with um, Women in Recovery, the program in Tulsa, in terms of a pay for success model. Mm -hmm. And so I want you to just talk about, um, you know, how the program works and what makes it a success in terms of Women in Recovery. What do you think makes, makes this program works so well? Well, I think it's a combination of things. Um, first of all, thanks to the George Kaiser Family Foundation, we are funded. And if you know anything about the um, addiction, um, it is a brain disease. And for women that have struggled with addiction for a very long period of time, um, there needs to be really long treatment that is also going to address, as everybody has said here today, um, early childhood trauma. And every one of the women who have been in um, the program have experienced early childhood trauma. About 70% of those women have experienced trauma around early sexual and physical abuse during early childhood and early adolescence. And it goes untreated. And so to be able to provide intense treatment for a long period of time um, really creates change in the brain. We are re-architecting that brain. But we also have identified all the barriers um, that also address women in the criminal justice system. So to be able to provide them the opportunity for health services and dental services, as well as employment skills, 67% of the women who come in are unemployed. They've had inconsistent work histories. So we've been able to really provide GED for the 37% that have not yet had the opportunity for their GED, employment readiness training, employment placement, um, computer utilization. We have our community college that is embedded there as well. And there's a couple other things that I think make the program pretty unique. One is we are very dual focused. So we know that children's trajectory is gonna follow their mother oftentimes. And so children have also experienced a great deal of trauma when their mother was in their addiction. So we get to provide services to the children and we get to create this opportunity for successful reunification. And then we all know that addiction is a, a lifetime disease. And um, we're studying the science and we know that long-term support is critical. So we have an aftercare program that is available to all of our grads for forever. Okay, and my understanding of the new pay for success model, which is just brand new, is that essentially um, the program uh, for successful graduates will be able to recoup uh, a percentage of, or an amount of what the, what the state would have spent to, to lock up that woman. Correct. So the pay for success, the ink is still pretty wet. The governor's, <laughs> the governor's signed our contract uh, April 10th. And so for a program that's 16, 17 months in, le uh, in length, we will start seeing some return from the state probably in October of 18. And there will be um, subsequent, four subsequent um, in, yeah. Incremental, incremental financial contributions right. as long as the woman doesn't reoffend and end up in the Department of Corrections. Okay, wonderful. And so, uh, Susan, you were, we were talking about Remerge, which is a program in Oklahoma City, similar to Women Recovery, has some slight differences. Can you just basically uh, just recap for people what Remerge is and how? how well, Remerge is another diversionary program. The same concept. It's newer, not as established as Women in Recovery, but so far it's had 80 women graduate. Yeah. Impacting 210 minor children, wow. as, as Mimi was pointing out. And the and indirect, you know, that, that's a lifetime of change for those kids. The lifetime of change for those kids. It's the same concept of providing those wraparound services to help the women 
A, get sober, and B, develop a lifestyle that's going to help them maintain right. being clean and sober. And, and uh, you know, that 5% recidivism rate already saved the state $12 million. Amazing. So, um, and, and for people who need it, want to, want to see like an actual face in this, this, these are not just numbers. We, you know, I want Sonia to tell us briefly about your story um, and, and then how, how women recovery changed your life. So I grew up in a very violent and chaotic home. I was, um, I experienced all types of abuse at a young age, emotional, physical, sexual. I started experimenting with drugs, with drugs and alcohol at a very young age. It um, seemed like the perfect way to escape the pain I endured. By age 19, I was completely addicted to methamphetamines, and that's when I had my first encounter with law enforcement. By age 24, I was incarcerated in the Oklahoma Department of Corrections for a drug-related crime, and I served nearly three years on that sentence. I wasn't provided with any services while I was in prison. I didn't get any drug treatment. I didn't need to be incarcerated. I needed help. It wasn't long after I was released from, from, from prison that I, my addiction spun out of control once again, and I reoffended and reoffended, and the, and the cycle continued on and on and so forth. Um, before entering the Women in Recovery program, I felt completely hopeless, helpless. I was homeless, living from motel to motel. I was full of fear, anxiety. I felt trapped, consumed by anger and shame. I was beyond tired of the chaos and I wanted help, but I didn't know how or where to turn and what that looked like. Um, my, one of my biggest motivations for treatment was seeing my oldest child now in addiction. And um, I wanted more than anything to break the vicious cycle of addiction in my family. I wanted a better life for my children. I didn't wake up and choose to be an addict. I didn't wake up one day and, and ask to be sexually abused and abused in all those other ways. But as a result from those traumatic experiences, I became an addict and addicted at a very young age. Um, the services I received in Weir are, well, there are many. Um, I received hundreds and hundreds of hours of individual and group therapy, clinical services, case management, health, housing. Um, I learned how to be a better and a different parent. Um, I learned every tool and every skill I needed to be successful in life while being a participant in the Women in Recovery program. So a major, major life change for you. Absolutely. And um, have you um, sort of Reunified with your family, and I mean, I mean just it separates families. Addiction, prison. I mean, it, it gets yes. mad at you, and so have you been able to sort of heal those wounds and gotten the skills that you need to do that? Yes, through women recovery. So I have been totally reunified with with my children and my young grandchild, who I have raised. Um, my oldest child is now a participant in the Women in Recovery program, mm -hmm. so she too is having the very same opportunities, right. the life changing experiences. Um, you know, with, without being a participant in the Women in Recovery program, none of this would have been possible. Fantastic. Good for you. <laughs> um, um, Laura, I want to go to you because you, you, you were um, in, the, in the trenches there working with these women, hearing their stories on the other side of it. And you've worked at the Department of Corrections how, how long? Since 2000. Okay. And um, you have heard their stories. Um, how, how big a factor is the um, early trauma that women um, suffer, and how do you think, you know, we talk about we need to start fixing this at the beginning instead of the end. How important is that? So it, it's incredibly important. It's everything. And what you've heard about is two programs that allow women to work through the trauma, work through the addiction, gain the skills that they need in lieu of coming to prison. Unfortunately, as a state, we tend to incarcerate as opposed to provide the services that really help turn 
their lives around, the lives of their children around, because it really is multi-generational. And so I'm gonna use a little bit of Susan's research yeah. um, about the women who are incarcerated in Oklahoma. And so two thirds of the women that are incarcerated have a history of uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse, or both. Two Most, two thirds. Most come from uh, childhoods of poverty. Most are born into homes where one or both parents were violent, one or both parents um, had mental illness that was untreated, had addiction that was untreated, saw uh, domestic violence as a way to solve conflict. Um, about a third of the women had one or both parents incarcerated when they were children. Um, everything that you can think of is layered one, of, you know, one on top of the other. It's not one bad thing one time. It's repeated uh, episodes, repeated events, and, and I'm sure that Sonia could speak to that better than I can, but it's a story that resounds throughout the women, and it's the common story, not the atypical story. And so what I think is incredible is that you have come this far, and that's what I was always left with with the women, is that I'm amazed that they made it to prison to begin with, mm -hmm. um, that they survived to get that far, um, and that they turned their lives around. And there's a lot of women in the audience today that have done exactly that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come back to you a little bit, and, t and I want to. Uh, I want to talk about what you wish people knew about prison and the work that you're doing there. Um, so think on that. And um, Susan, I want to, you to talk about your book, uh, Mean Mean Lives, Mean Laws. Okay. Um, and you did a lot of research on this topic. You're a national expert. Tell us, sort of, if you can, sort of the main takeaways um, that you that you found in doing the research. What do people need to know about this problem? They need to know it's not mean women, and that's sort of the play on words that the title is about. It's not that we have a bunch of bad women, that our women are worse in the state of Oklahoma. It's that they have those lives that are very deprived, all the abuse that we've heard described here. That's the mean lives, lives of poverty, lives of abuse. And then we have laws, too, that interact with that. So we have women who start using drugs to cope with their childhood abuse or in some cases domestic violence as an adult. And then we have laws that are far more punitive than the states around us and really than any states. And so that's like a perfect storm in this state. It's the explanation or part of the explanation of why we have such a high female incarceration rate mm -hmm. in the state. Part of it, too, is that in most states, um, sentences of one year or less, or in some states, two years or less, are not served in the Department of Corrections. They're served in county jails. Our county jails, because of the way um, our statutes read, are more holding facilities to get to the Department of Corrections. Um, so that I, and I'm not sure that one is worse than the other county jails have even less funding and less available for treatment. We've heard a lot about how little treatment was available in the Department of Corrections, mm -hmm. but they do the best they can with the very limited funding they have. We're just wasting our funding is my position, and that's kind of the takeaway of the book, that if we focused on childhood and helping women when they first start getting into trouble, instead of um, slapping a felony on them, let's work with them to help them get their lives back together and keep their family together, and then we're preventing that next generation. Okay. Great. Um, well, like I said, uh, you all do great work. I, I read a statistic that about a third of um, correctional officers at the Department of Corrections uh, qualify for Correct. Um, which is a sad statistic. I mean, Absolutely. Was, there's um, a tremendous amount of work that you all have to do with a very limited resources. So talk, what do you wish people knew about the work that the Department of Corrections does? So the Department of Corrections is um, chronically underfunded, um, so we're not funded adequately to do the job that we are missioned to do. We have uh, no control, no say-so over who comes in the door. Um, folks are sentenced to us from all over the all over the state. Around 90% of our budget goes to pay for four things. The four things it pays for is staff salary and benefits, 
pays for contracted beds because we don't have enough state beds to put the people that are um, sentenced to us. Yeah, there are about 8,000 inmates in Correct, in contracted states. beds. Um, it pays for medical care for the offenders and it pays for food for the offenders. So that leaves 10% to address probation and parole offenders' needs, to address programming, to address maintenance needs for facilities, which are really largely neglected. We have over $140 million of, of urgent facility maintenance needs. So it's simply underfunded, and so we're not able to provide the level of programs that we would like to provide. Um, we have some limited substance abuse treatment, education, um, criminal thinking, cognitive behavioral kind of programs. We have um, career tech, um, and we're working to improve, far improve, our reentry planning. All of that takes staffing, all of that takes sure. money to be able to accomplish those objectives. But unfortunately, you know, less than a third typically of people who have an education need, have a substance abuse treatment need, are able to come into the system, get into the program, complete it before they release. Mm -hmm. We simply don't have enough resources. Okay. Um, so I'd like to uh, have each one of you talk about just one thing that you think um, that could, should be done, could be done to tackle this problem. It doesn't have to be anything like a specific policy thing, but one thing, what area you wish the legislature, the governor, that people would focus on, people in power to change this would focus on. And I want to point out that there's a task force that spent a lot of time studying this. They issued 27 recommendations. Um, I tweeted a link to it a little while ago. Um, and the, some of these recommendations are like, you know, very specific. Revise the habitual uh, offender statute to focus the most severe punishment on violent offenders. So if you have a prior, it doesn't matter if it's a very minor prior or if it's a very violent prior, it's treated the same. Judges don't have discretion in a lot of cases. So, um, you know, the fines and the fees, when people get out of prison, it's just incredible. Um, and that's another recommendation. So talk to me about one thing, and um, I know that you probably have an opinion yes. on this too. So I <laughs> yes, want you to talk I, to me about what you I have a very, a very strong opinion, especially um, in regard to the fines and the fees. Um, so not only exiting prison now with a felony record, of being a convicted felon, now I have these thousands and thousands of dollars of fines and costs. Mm -hmm. And to this day, and after I've been paying on these for several years, I still own, I still, excuse me, I still owe several thousand, we're talking more than $40,000 in fines and costs that have accumulated over the years yeah. and since my last. And so it, it, it seems like no matter how hard you work, you can't ever get out of this. I, right, it's, it's hard for me to see the light at the end of the tunnel, yeah. at the tunnel when we're talking about that. How am I ever going to pay this? I'll leave this earth still owing. And one of the recommendations of the task force is realistic repayment schedules, mm -hmm. and also not sending people like back to jail or prison for not paying. Mimi, what about you? You know, each one of those issues is so critical. We did a little study around fines and fees with a TU, with a TU law student last year, and the Collectively, the 100 women that were there that day had over $523,000 of fines and fees that were owed. So we're setting people up for failure. But I do want to say that since we started this work, we've seen about a 54% decrease in female receptions. And so when I think about really communities From making a change for Tulsa County, um, this is really exciting. And I, th I think we have to remain focused on on pulling back the onion, looking at the gaps, keeping people, not the thought leaders, but the change leaders, and really like fighting these <laughs> issues like Tulsa County has. And it requires the PDs to be there and the district attorney's office to be there and the judiciary to be there. And as a community, fight these issues together so that one by one we can really see some, continue to see significant change. I don't think you can sit back. I think we have to be relentless. Mm -hmm. We have to stay on the issues. Mm -hmm. um, Could you expand um, the model of women in recovery and reemerge um, on a pay for success model? Couldn't you expand that to other counties? Couldn't you do it statewide? I think there's, I think we're very fortunate that we have funding to do the work that we do, but right. I think that much of what both of our programs provide is very replicatable. And so mm -hmm. we are very willing to also share what we've learned, lessons right. learned, what doesn't work, what does work, but I think it is so fundamentally important to collaborate and to keep, this is a community problem. Sure. Um, Dr. Pittman, what do you think? So I, I, I 
agree with both my, both my peers. Um, what you see in Tulsa really is a community coming together and the community deciding that they're not gonna be one of the two leading counties in terms of sending women to incarceration in Oklahoma. Um, that program, Women in Recovery, really was replicated in Oklahoma County through Remerge. Mm -hmm. the, probably the biggest difference really is it has to do with funding streams and has to do with the, the community engagement and the way that it was approached and the way that it was started. But it certainly can be done in multiple communities. Mm -hmm in terms of what do we need to do, um, you know, Mimi talked about community. This is a community issue. It's not a Department of Corrections issue. It's not a, just people who are incarcerated or their families issue. It's a community issue. And when we're talking about people who are in need of help in a community, that's how it needs to be addressed, in community. When we're talking about people who are releasing from prison, mm -hmm. they're returning to a community. Yeah. They're returning to be a citizen. And I know that the ban the box um, trend is, is something that a lot of people think will work. Um, so. And we need to rethink how we use our prisons in Oklahoma. Prisons are for people who are a threat to public safety. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. That's what prisons are for. And Susan, we'll wrap it up with you and then I'll take some questions in just a minute. Um, what do you think? Well, Maybe you, one thing at least. First, I agree with everything that's been <laughs> said. Second, you stole my thunder because the ban the box movement uh, across multiple dimensions, across employment, across education. I don't know how many people in this room know, but most of our institutions of higher learning automatically will disqualify and the person has to appeal for admission mm. if they have a felony conviction uh, and housing. So those three areas are things I think we also need to keep in this discussion of moving forward and what we can change because uh, to take away someone's opportunity to make a decent living to support themselves and their family for the rest of their life. After they've paid their debt. After right. they've paid their debt. Yeah. And that we're seems. talking about something that's a public health issue as the last group stated anyway uh, with addiction. That's just so unjust. Yeah, I was looking at some numbers from the task force report about the, the number of women that are, you know, first time offenders, no felony record, 80% um, have no history of violent crimes, 75% of people admitted to prison were sentenced for nonviolent crimes, over half uh, sentenced to prison for have uh, one or no prior mm -hmm. felonies. So we have a lot of people going in there that don't meet the... And, and Ziva, if I could, based on the projections that were done in advance for the governor's task force, you know, the growth for Oklahoma, we're talking about a 25% growth over the next 10 years. If we don't do something. 60% of that growth is females. Right, and they're gonna have to so. spend $1.9 billion and build three prisons mm -hmm. if something doesn't right. change. And Ziva, can I add one thing to that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that also, as one of the gentlemen earlier described, we have got to address the children. It is devastating Absolutely. for children. This so starting children earlier are, and earlier. Are linked. Absolutely. Um, so we have time, I'm just sorry, we have like six minutes of questions and be happy to, okay. Any questions? Lanny Haybrock with the Institute for Child Advocacy. So one of the staggering statistics that have, I think a lot of us kind of our minds reeling is that Native American women are incarcerated at three times the rate of their peers and black women at two times the rate of their peers. So my question is, have other states or other cities invested in training people who work in Department of Corrections or in the uh, justice system in implicit bias? And have we seen any returns on that? I mean, this is a disparity, oh, good in the question. research I did, these disparities exist you know, nationwide, certainly, but there's a big difference between Oklahoma and some states. And it's a growing area, and no, it's not permeated our department yet, but things are moving in that direction. Unfortunately, we're not there yet. So the question was about implicit bias training, and I think it's something that we need to add to our list of solutions, uh, because Absolutely. if you don't end up in prison, and you I, don't have that problem. And across the criminal justice system, it's not sentencing. Right, it's Law across the criminal justice system, not right. just Department of Corrections. At every step. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so my name is Rhonda Bear, and uh, I'm with Stand of the Gap Ministry, and I just have a comment about uh, something Mimi said about disease. Uh, addiction is the disease of the brain, and what really frustrates me in our state is in our rural communities. 
we are giving life sentences to Mabel Bassett for failing drug court. Not rape, to women. Okay, rural communities, these women are poor. Yes. They're single moms with children. We're talking about the and they are getting life at Mabel Bassett for failing drug court. Not only is that over a million dollars for taxpayers, but what an unjust sentence in this state, and we tolerate it. We found seven women in our, in our um, story of her reveal, seven women who were doing life sentences for drug, drug crimes. Yes, and those were, a lot of those, the seven were habitual, they had fallen under the right. habitual act, but there's more that are coming in that, that she didn't get that number from Delaware County right. that are getting life here recently within the last year for failing drug court. So what, when it's a disease of the mind, and yet we're gonna punish you for life and punish your children. Thank you for that comment, that's very... So can I speak yeah, to it? So, Rhonda, thank you for the question. Again, Tulsa County looks so different than the rural communities, and what we've done and what we've been able to implement in Tulsa County, which is really very exciting, is for women that are failing drug court and they need a more intensive opportunity, then they are being assessed for WIR. I wish that could happen in other communities, but I am happy to say that it is a replicatable practice that should happen in other places. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I would just, and I, I would like to say, and also to your comment, Rhonda, that the disease, addressing the underlying issues that lead to addiction is where we need to start. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Okay. And another question? Sam? My name is Donna Thompson, and I'm from the Fairview Baptist Church Prison Ministry. And I have a couple of courses real quick. One, I was wanting to know, has anybody looked at the fact, and I'll just talk about Oklahoma County right now, of the cost once you go into the Oklahoma County Jail. This is like 174 or 178. Somebody researched that later, okay? As a person goes into, there is an actual cost. I was concerned about that because, you know, there's a budget set aside, so why is the person being charged for that? And my second question is this, what type of education, training um, is there being given to the, law, the district attorneys as well as the judges in regards to mandatory sentencing? And how much flexibility do they have to sentence a person instead, uh, rather than an alternative to incarceration? So one quick takeaway, the task force did recommend that judges have more ability to depart from those mandatory minimums. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, if we're going to elect people to be judges, right, we have to give them the discretion and allow them to depart. Do any of y'all have a comment on that? Well, I would just add one thing, just to ping off of that, and that is we have to train and educate everybody in the criminal justice system around trauma-informed practices and gender responsive yeah. practices yeah. so that they can make better decisions. Um, yeah, and as far as the fees that are charged inmates to, for the privilege of staying in the jail, that is a, a problem that a lot of counties have balanced their budgets as the state has cut back or as they've lost mm -hmm. other sources of revenue. They've tried to balance um, their budgets on the backs of inmates, their families, phone calls, commissary, all of those things. So, yeah. Question? Yes. Yes. Shelley Academy with Workforce Tulsa. So the, the task force that the Criminal Justice Task Force last year, those 27 recommendations were turned into legislation that sailed through the Senate and hit a wall in the House Correct. because the Speaker of the House allowed them to stay in an unfriendly committee. So for That's lots true. of reasons, economic development, which I've done for 25 years in Oklahoma, being one of them, I'm wondering how we can, I'm asking the panel, this is my question, um, how, we, how we might make sure that doesn't happen again this year, and I would ask everybody in this room to think about that as well. So, how, so the question is how, how can, um, there were uh, 12 uh, s proposals for change mm -hmm. that um, basically failed to get out of committee because of particular lawmakers. So how, how, can we, how can people help with that process? I think it's really important to energize the communities to contact their legislators. Mm -hmm. Especially rural. Repeatedly. Um, I've been told by some legislators that after they get the fifth call <laughs> on the same topic, then they will go look at it and really take into account what's been said. So I think that, you know, in the end, we elect the legislators and they are accountable to us. And I think we need to remember that. 
So reach out to your lawmakers, call and email is, is what I'm hearing. I'm and gonna, I would, I'm gonna sound like a civics lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Vote. Vote. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. who makes the laws? Legislators make the laws. Who votes in the legislators? We do. <laughs> so if you don't like the laws, if you want to change sentencing structure, if you want to change fines, fees, restitution, if you want to change uh, maximums, if you, you got to make your voices heard. Make your voice heard. Absolutely. I've, I've got to, I've got to wrap it up. We are uh, out of time. Thank you all so much for coming, uh, and to the Atlanta especially for the work on this.